What's going on? It's Jason Heath, and today I am getting schooled in jazz bass soloing. Danny Zeman is a great friend and colleague of mine, and he's done so many cool things in the bass world. He has just released Topics in Jazz Bass Volume 2 Soloing, and that is a big topic for sure. And Danny and I had the idea to do a lesson on some of the most common pitfalls in jazz bass soloing and what you can do to set yourself up for success. So if you want to hear me sing, play, chat with Danny, and just get a lesson, that's what you're going to get today. You know, a lot of the students I worked with, there always seems to be this divide between comfort in, in playing bass lines and accompanying and then comfort with soloing. Uh, and they seem to be two different ideas or two different like methods or modes of playing. And so what I set out to do was create a resource that bridged the gap between accompanying and walking bass lines and playing solos. Because if you think about it, really, all of the great characteristics of a bass line, you know, great sound, confident sense of rhythm, clarity of harmony, relatedness to the tune and a sense of interaction with the band. I mean, those are all the, the things that create a great solo too. It has less to do with, with technique and facility and more about the confidence and assuredness with which we play. There seems to be a lot of these ideas about what good solos do. And there's also this sense of taboo around soloing in the bass community. Like either I don't need to solo uh, because I'm a bassist, uh, which we know is not true because all of our favorites uh, throughout history have soloed, but also this confusion about how to actually go forth and, and learn it. Whether we need to learn a lot of music theory and memorize our scales and our modes, or if there are you know other ways to do it. I set out to create something that was totally flexible that starts with listening, so the emphasis is just on absorbing information by ear, and then it has a, a pathway that's uh, individual to the reader. So you can actually go through the chapters in any order, whether you want to learn vocabulary first or do more ear training and transcribing or focus on sound. I conceived it as sort of being like a musical playground. I can demonstrate this and if you want mm -hmm. to take a crack at it too, yeah, totally fine. Um, the way that I'm doing this is, is a more of an advanced way of doing it. So anyone who's going through the book has the option of just singing with the backing track. But what I'll mm -hmm. do, is, you know, we'll say we're in the key of C major. So I'm going to play uh, a 2 5 1. It's going to be one bar of D minor, one bar of G7, and then two bars of C major. And I'm going to play the roots of the chords and just sing one of the guide tone lines. So I'll sing starting on the seventh of D minor 7, which is C. Then I'll sing the third of G7 which is B, and then I'll sing the third of C major, or sorry, the seventh of C major seven, which is the, which is B natural. Uh, it's a lot easier to hear it, a lot more mm -hmm. difficult to, to, mm -hmm. to spit it out. Um, but that would just go something like this. One, two, three, four. Ba -da -da. Just like that. And then I can go to the next one, which is, Bum, bum, bum. Mm -hmm. And that's just, that's hearing the harmony move through the chords. I don't want to put you on the spot, but do you yeah, want to try Yeah, let me do it. Bum, bum. Yeah. How'd I do? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. That's great. And so you can do that. Um, you know, what I encourage people in the, to do within the book is just to go through the, the cycle or uh, I have the 251 set up in a way so you can go through them kind of in a row. Mm -hmm. um, just to get comfortable with that sound. The thing I want to impress upon people is like there's nothing that's too elementary when you're digging into soloing. Um, and this is something where you learn them, you learn the guide tones, and then you ultimately forget them. It's just mm -hmm. like a way to really build some comfort in the beginning. So you can do things like doing this progression, but then continuing. Um, so if I have and I'm going to B flat. Then Then I go to the next guide tone line. The next thing to do is understand how the guide tones are present 
in chord changes, how we already outline them in bass lines. If you've ever walked a bass line before, you've absolutely outlined a guide tone line. And these are the same guide tones that inform the way that we play solos. So do you actually want to model figure 1.2 and figure 1.3? All right, 1.2. So we got a little uh, little 251 action here. Uh, uh, one, two, three, four. All right, um, and then from 1.3, uh, two, three, four. Yeah. Again, the harmony is laid out in the same way. What we do when we walk a bass line is we're, we're just dealing with the fundamental information. Mm -hmm. And then when you build solo vocabulary, you either have Arpeggios, the scale patterns, like, uh, or enclosures, like that, or little little turns. So this is the foundation to really getting comfortable playing vocabulary. Vocabulary later on is actually being able to recognize the guide tones, hear how we deal with it in our bass lines, and then use that to bridge the gap to. To soloing. I would be curious uh, if, if there was anything else you wanted to play maybe from like the arpeggio section like page 56 I think it is. Yeah this is where this is where life's getting a little tricky for old Jason here. <laughs> and this <laughs> well, is where like my fingering choices although you've got this in a very friendly register but if we if as soon as we get down into um, even the even the second line I'm starting to think like okay E flat major like my classical brain says I should go you know, I find myself, and then I think, wait, okay, what if I, well, how would you encourage me to think about, um, and I, I love that you, I'm sure this is a conscious story, so I love that you didn't put fingerings, because that, that opens up a whole other can of, of complexities. It's great to figure out, but like, what would you recommend for anybody, or me in particular? Yeah, so so there are two, two ways you can go about it. Um, one of the ways, and this is, again, I always go to like encouraging listening like before anything else. Mm -hmm. In the supplemental recording, excuse me, in the supplemental recordings, you can actually listen and see if, if you could, can sort of intuitively tell if I'm using open strings or if I'm staying mm -hmm. in one position. Mm -hmm. uh, because like you were talking about before, playing is different than you get different different ways of shifting between the two. And so that's always like what I'm listening for when I try to transcribe something is try to figure out what position people are playing in based on the sound and the, the note choices surrounding that. So mm -hmm. that's the first thing I would say. But the second thing is always go with the path, path of least resistance. <laughs> um, because when we're improvising, we're not like we can plan out a whole bunch of stuff. Like we practice to be able to play with freedom in the moment. Um, but ultimately, I'm not thinking about like what fingering path I'm going to be using necessarily. So I'm always trying to, to do everything in a, in a consolidated position if, if possible. Uh, so yeah, so for that example, I mean, you could play or so You know, really trying to take advantage of, of as much as I can across three strings before shifting. Mm -hmm. Another bad habit I have that I noticed playing through this is, is not, um, and I think that this would help my playing in arco playing as well as pizzicato playing, but I, I have the, I'm always moving on to the next note perhaps too fast. So like if I start at the beginning, uh, I'm, oh, sorry, let me try that again. Well, I'm, I'm not doing as bad a job as I sometimes do. Um, but I, 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 I'm not thinking. I'm not thinking about where can I sustain? Where can I keep that finger down to get a little bit of extra ring in the bass? It's something that I notice, and I hear in your playing. I mean, even just when you're playing like one note, I hear that like growl and that sustain out of out of your bass. And it's something I just think I think like I I go. Mm -hmm. 
and I like let go. I don't, I just don't, I don't, um, I don't connect it with the fingerboard in a way that, that necessarily produces that sort of meaty resonant sound that I hear in your playing. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, I, would you be willing to try it again? And I can just yes. give you one, one thing to think Please. about. Excellent. So I would maybe try it just a hair slower. And mm -hmm. then I want you to imagine as if everything you're playing in your left hand is under a slur. Mm. Uh, two, three, four. Yeah, even that, especially in these notes, like, uh, mm. I heard it, especially on the, the A string, you, you were sinking into the string a bit more. I'm trying, but you still get this sound. I can't, I gotta work on it like that, that note, like even right there, that, uh, that, I don't, you've got this, it's this way of just, yeah, you, it's like, and it, I don't think it has anything to do with strings or, I think it's just, it's touch and sound and, and this co sound concept. Um, it, like, I get, there's just this like roundness and continuity to the notes. So that's cool. I'm gonna, as I continue to work on these, I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna, cause I want the next time, I don't know when this will happen, but the next time I hear that hi-hat and all of a sudden Jason Heath has to take a solo, I wanna be able to get some of those Danny Zeman sounds out, out of my bass. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, it, for me, it's like, yeah, maximizing that, that, that sustain and that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do like, I almost call it, it's not even vibrato. It's like a wiggle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, just to really get it to sustain a bit more. That's a sound that my, my ear is drawn to. And uh, that's a cool thing about vocabulary is like, it works with all these different concepts of, of sound. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a matter of like finding out what that sound is for you, what you like and being able to hone in on it and play, it's like consistency, right? You know, it, like having yeah. a big sound is not about playing loud or having a great sound is not about doing this thing. It's just consistency, whatever that means to you, mm -hmm. finding ways to make it consistent and, and sing on your instrument. I've got another thing I'd love to try if you're, if you're mm -hmm. up for it. Let's do it. So this is something I love doing with my students and it's not explicitly in this book, but the idea is, is still talked about in terms of sound. Um, I would love to do just some like call and, re call and repeat. Mm -hmm. We can just set the parameters and then we just focus on basically trying to match the sound and the length of the note um, just based on what we're what we're hearing. So usually, what I do is I turn my camera off, and we can keep it we can keep it on for for this. Um, but let's let's set the parameter as like. Well, actually, how about this? It's my master plan. Um, <laughs> let's let's use some of the notes from like the blues chapter. Okay. This this is page one ten. Mm hmm. Um, and so one, one thing I try to be very careful about in this, and this, this is, um, you know, the tradition of the blues is so deep and the blues cannot be embodied by just a scale. You know, it's like saying, okay, I've got my, uh, I've got my jazz scale. I've got my blues scale. I've got my rock and roll drum beat. I've got my jazz drum beat. It's like, you can't, you can't distill the essence of something down to just a few, uh, you know, a few characteristics. So what I try to do in, in the blues chapter, and you know, I could, I could write about the blues like loads and loads and loads more, just because of its, you know, its uh, association with the history of jazz. But, uh, you know, I like to find just a few notes that embody some of the, the blues qualities, like especially when I'm walking or playing a 12 bar blues that are not based on a, a scale. So what I'm gonna do is take some of those little phrases and we can just play them back and forth and again we're just trying to match each other's phrasing length of note articulation all all of those things that are encapsulated under i guess sound and phrasing sounds good so we'll be in the key of b flat um we'll just start simply
Oh. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you're already, you're totally like, you know, you're you're checking out the length of the note and everything. That's awesome. So I bet if I was to teach you um uh like a blue like if we were to riff on the 12 bar blues and let me just get my my book out here um so let's check this out uh so if i was to teach you uh i'll teach you my favorite my favorite song okay <laughs> this is something i learned uh 15 years ago from a great teacher. It's called No Major Third on the Four Chord. And listen, anyone who's like a full-time professional who hears me sing this right now will probably laugh and then hate me because it's going to be the most annoyingly catchy song. They will never forget this. I'm telling you, you will <laughs> never forget this song. <laughs> and it's a way to think about playing over the blues and recognizing those guide tones mm -hmm. without thinking about the blues scale, which doesn't really, again, teach us how to use it or when or why or any of those things. So it goes like this, and I'll, I'll sing it and I'll play the accompaniment at the same time, which is hard, so uh, <laughs> please be kind. So it goes like this, uh, one, two, three, four. No major third on the four chord. Major third on the four chord. No 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 So cheesy, but it works. You want to I try love it. With me? Sure, let's do it. So it's just no major third on the four chord. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So let's let's try it. You can. Um, I'll snap and I'll sing quietly, and you can just sing along. Maybe the the viewers at home will have to pick which one of us they want to sing with. Right, right, right. We'll just, we'll just try it. So, uh, okay. so this is our starting pitch. If we're in the key of B flat, then B flat would be do. For anyone who's singing from home, you can also sing it an octave up. Um, but yeah, here we go. One, two, three, four, no, no major, major third, third on, on the, the four, four chord. chord. No, no major, major third, third on, on the four, the four chord. chord. No, no major, major third, third on, on the, the four, four chord. chord. So, and you can shed that. There's a recording. <laughs> I don't sing it in the recording, but you can shed that. And what that does is it tells you like how to get into riffing, which is great for playing the blues, but also for walking bass lines. Um, you know, also how to, to embody, you know, parts of the blues or at least like, you know, play it uh, maybe a bit closer to, I don't even want to say the tradition, but just like get closer to playing it well. Then again, just thinking like, which is like, you know, what bass players would like to do or likely do when they start mm -hmm. soloing, which is not a dig. But if I can play something like, uh, something like that where I'm just riffing or even like you know 
-hmm. something where I'm mm -hmm. like going through that that riff uh, because it gets us again just more comfortable with with tapping into the the history of the blues and playing stuff that works over the chord changes and all we're doing is finding one idea and just changing one note about it. That's a look inside this great new book from Danny Zeman. I highly recommend it. Danny has done so many great things over the years. Check out the links in the description below to Danny, his website, this new book, and more. Thank you so much for checking this out. And if you want to learn more about jazz bass, check out this video we've got linked here.